Ephesians chapter 3 tonight. I titled the message, Christ-Centered Ministry. And one of the reasons for the thought of Christ-Centered Ministry helps us really understand the purpose of ministry and kind of, you know, where we are in this. In chapter 3, we see an emphasis here in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I think that the Christ-centered life produces Christ-centered ministry, Christ-centered mission. And Paul here explains how God appointed him to proclaim this marvelous plan of the proclamation of the gospel that would both unite both Jews and Gentiles together in Christ. Something unheard of. As a matter of fact, he emphasizes in verse 6 that the closer they are to God, the closer they were to each other. And remember that initially we see here that the Jews had had a certain disdain for the Gentiles, but in Christ, he removes all of this. And so we see a couple of things of this Christ-centered ministry, at least here in chapter 3, that I believe that Paul here is highlighting. We'll start here with the very start of the chapter, and we see here that a Christ-centered ministry follows the will of Christ, follows the will of God. And here Paul kind of expressed this truth here at the very start of this. Now remember, at the close of chapter 2, he, he goes on to say here that we are of the household of God, that we are being built together a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So he talks about how physically we are those who have been redeemed by Christ, but then he says spiritually we are a, a house, we are a body. Verse 19 says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also were being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So with this note here, he goes on to say in verse 1 of chapter 3, for this reason, now notice what he's saying here as he's talking about this household of God, being built upon this foundation. The foundation is the proclamation of the gospel. But he talks about here, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. In other words, bound to and for Christ. This is the emphasis that I think is important that Paul begins to describe here because he did not choose the stewardship of his apostleship or his ministry. He didn't choose it. God sovereignly commissioned him with the calling. This is what he's going to see. So in verse 1, we see here a prisoner of the king, a prisoner of Christ, not a prisoner of Caesar, but a prisoner of Christ, a prisoner of the king. And he supports that also in verse 13 by not only being a prisoner of a king, but also a shepherd of the people. This is really the ministry of Paul. So this is what Christ-centered ministry looks like. So in essence, we can say here that in verse 1, Christ-centered ministry follows the will of Christ. Now, keep in mind, what does this look like? Well, we should, as Christians, live what is called a Christ-centered life. What is the focus? What is the emphasis? What is the aim? And some would call it uh, uh, Christocentric type of life. In other words, it is a life that is focused upon a commitment to following Jesus. But not only a commitment to following Jesus, a commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, we've heard this statement before, if he's not the Lord of all, then he's not the Lord at all. You can't say that you have a Christ-centered life if Jesus is not the center of it all. We looked a little bit at the object of our worship, right? 
We kind of looked at what Paul was expressing through the objects of their worship. And ultimately, Jesus is the center of it all. It's important today that we understand that the Christ-centered ministry has its foundations and root, strong roots in a Christ-centered life. So this thought here, I think, can relate to many of us, because if you look at this, you can consider this, that the core of every human decision or every thought that we have or perhaps how we live is motivated by something or someone. And it could be motivated by some things like people and pleasure and money and, you know, goals that we have, jobs, whatever the case might be. Um, some, even their families, and all of this here, these are things that they're not wrong in and of themselves, but we're not to center our lives on those things in making them our God. Jesus is to be the one to be the center of our lives. Why? Because if we go back to, you know, the book of Genesis and we see, as we've been studying on Sunday mornings, as we look at the purpose that God created man for. God created man in his image and in his likeness. So the human heart was designed to worship. Ultimately, to worship the Lord God. And if it does not worship God, then what is it going to do? It's going to worship something else. And I think oftentimes we tread on this lightly. Because we feel that, you know, we can try to do both. Jesus made it very clear, you, you can't do both. You, you can't serve two masters. You will love one and you'll hate the other. You'll, you'll wrestle with the very fact that um, giving more time to one and not enough time to the other. And, and in essence, this is what happens. And you can't, you can't hold on to, as I've stated before, you can't hold on to the world with one hand and Jesus with the other. It doesn't work that way. So the center, really, of or Christ-centered is truly a life that is focused upon the lordship of Jesus. This is what I believe Paul is expressing here. As he says here, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. Now remember that Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles. This is what the Lord said he would be doing from the very start of it. Initially, you know, Saul of Tarsus was on his mission there in Acts chapter 9. He was, he was doing what he thought was the will of God. And Saul believed it with all of his heart. He truly believed with all of his heart that he was doing the will of God. Remember that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he said in his own words, that he was a very religious man. And he even spoke, you know, in his letter to Timothy saying, you know, I did all these things. I imprisoned people. I, I did these things, he says, in ignorance. Really what he was saying was, I didn't have a knowledge of who Christ was. I did it without the knowledge of Christ. I did it with religion at the center of my life rather than Christ at the center. And ultimately, what did it produce? It produced a very religious and zealous man that ultimately was working against the gospel of Christ. And then he has this encounter with Jesus. And, and, and all of this, guys, it was all a part of God's purpose and plan. And notice that every time that Paul refers back to his apostleship, he refers to it with great humility because he knows that even though if we look at it on paper, I mean, he has the degrees and the pedigree to be somebody that should be recognized and revered as this guy would make a great apostle. But it was all in vain. And what happens is, you'll see a little bit later, his humility in verse 8, kind of working his way through the rest of these verses, where he begins to express, you know, ultimately, I'm nothing. I thought I was something. I thought I was doing the will of God. But ultimately, he says, I wasn't. And then God there, in this moment of just, you know, a, what we call a come to Jesus moment. If you guys have ever heard of those. So when you say, you know, you've got to have a come to Jesus moment with them, you know. This is what happened with, with Saul. The Lord stopped him dead in his tracks. God intervened. 
And why did God intervene? Because God had a purpose and a plan for Saul of Tarsus. And God intervened in a way that would get Saul's attention. And he did. And not only Saul's attention, he also got Ananias' attention as well when the Lord says, you know, go and pray for this guy. And Ananias, you know, said to the Lord, as the Lord had called him to go, he says, Lord, in verse 13 of Acts 9, he says, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. You know, and here's just a thought. You know, he's on his way to Damascus. Ananias is a believer, a disciple in Damascus, and he's going over there for the purpose to imprison Christians and kill them. I mean, this is what Saul was doing, because to him, the way, that's what they called the church then, followers of the way, they were false. There was no truth. They were following a false Christ, a false Messiah. And what's interesting here is that, you know, it could very well be that Ananias, who the Lord is calling,